So I like to go paddle boarding by myself, especially during the summer months. West of my hometown there's this remote labi just off the motorway and past some picnic tables through a little stretch of forest, there's a lake hardly anybody knows about. Every few weeks I'll get the itch and carry a paddle and a board down to the water. Then I'll float around enjoying the sound of waves crashing against shore for hours on end. It's perfect. Like a little slice of heaven carved out just for me. The only problem is, sometimes, other people ruin my plans. Take last week. As I lay flat on my stomach, mesmerized by the sunbeams sparkling across the surface of the water, this black speck appeared over on the lakeside. I got to my knees and cupped my hand against the setting sun. An intruder had stepped out of the underbrush. A real hulk of a guy. He shuffled over toward my clothes, which were in a crumbled heap on the embankment, then his eyes crawled all over me. Even from a distance, I caught a bad vibe. All my valuables, phone, keys, wallet, were safely tucked away inside a waterproof pack attached to the back of the board, so I steered in circles for a while, watching the creep from the corner of my eye. He shouted something, although his voice didn't carry far enough to hear. I gave a half-assed wave, hoping he'd take the hint. But in my gut, I already knew what sort of bastard I was dealing with. I mean, those sorts of negative experiences were the whole reason I needed to go out there and clear my mind in the first place. Phone signal dropped the second you step into the forest, so calling for help wasn't an option. Aside from the beach, most of the lake was surrounded by steep, rocky slope. An Olympic climber could maybe scramble up using the exposed roots, but if I gave it a go, either my grip would give out or a dirt clod would become loose, then I'd topple backwards onto a jagged rock and snap every bone in my body. The simple fact is there was only one way in or out. Five minutes passed. Ten. Twenty. Now and again fish leapt into the air, then a black shape caught my attention and circled my position before plunging into the depths. The lake was so deep only a trained diver could reach the bottom in a single breath. If I squinted, I could make out wriggly movement way down there, like a tightly packed cluster of kelp, the thin tendrils swaying in the current. As it grew darker, I got chillier and chillier. The fatigue sure didn't help either, soon the muscles in my arms were screaming. Meanwhile, the man just stood there staying out there all night seemed like a surefire way to catch pneumonia and in his raincoat and hiking boots, the guy sure didn't look like he was in a hurry. Left with no other choice, I rode toward the bank. Not too close, but close enough to speak with him. Also, I know what you're thinking, but there was no point trying to run. Between the embankment and my car there was a maze of jagged nettles and crisscrossed branches with sharp ends. That's one hell of a gauntlet to run barefoot. The distance between me and the man shrunk to the length of a volleyball net. Even in the dying light, I could see hairs plastered against his forehead in sweaty tangles. I rode along on the back of a few limp waves. Evening, darling, he yelled. I nodded. Bit late for surfing, isn't it? You must be freezing in that tight swimsuit. I let myself drift around a bit. Pretty peaceful here, and it's one hell of a view, he said, studying my body. You out here by yourself? Nope. My boyfriend's with me. He just went for a hike. Is that right? You know you ought to be more careful about leaving your stuff behind. Some thief might have pinched it. The wind cranked up a notch. Along the coast, tree limbs scraped together roughly. What's the matter? Don't you want to talk? He asked in a clipped way that made it clear he was pissed. It's rude to ignore people. I was just trying to be nice. Why don't you come over and say hi? I kept myself from getting dragged to shore with carefully timed dips of the paddle. You think I'm some kind of pervert or something? You think I'm gonna hurt you? I didn't say that. Then why not come over? Because I don't know you. That ugly blob of a face grinned, revealing all these rotten molars. You're right. That was rude. I'm Desi, but you can call me DJ. He waited, then added, Well, aren't you gonna tell me your name? For a moment there was no sound except the wind. Against my wet skin, it cut right to the bone. Aren't you coming in yet? He called. You don't want to catch a cold. I'll take my chances. He spat at me, although the wad fell well short. A long runner of milky drool hung from the corner of his mouth, stretching out. He wiped it away. Listen, I'm not leaving until you do the ladylike thing and introduce yourself. Just leave me alone. I'm a complete pacifist, so I'd given the idiot every opportunity to walk away. I really, really had... 
The last thing I wanted was for somebody to get hurt, believe me. His hand reached into the water and made sloshing waves. The board thrashed around, its left side dipping below the surface several times, and I had trouble staying upright. Desi said, you know this is a dangerous place, right? Pretty little thing like you, out here all alone? You might get grabbed by sinking Susie. That caught my attention. Desi, delighted to finally have an audience, said, loads of folks, they set off for a nice little walk out here. They stumble across the lake, think they'd like to take a little dip to cool off. Then Susie gets him. He waited to see whether I'd take the bait. I didn't, although he pressed on anyway. See, Susie lived near here with her husband. He was a fisherman, so he'd be away for weeks. And Susie kept herself busy with these nature walks. She liked the fresh air, you know? But one day, she goes for a walk and hears giggling. And when she gets closer, she realizes it's her husband rolling around with another lady. Pretty little blonde thing, kinda like you. So Susie parks herself beside a tree and cries and cries until the couple have their fun and then she goes and stands by the water, all heartbroken. She doesn't want to live anymore. So she fills her pockets with rocks and walks out and lets herself sink. But that's not even the worst part. He paused for dramatic effect. Cause Susie drowns but she doesn't die. She's cursed now. Which means she's stuck lurking underwater, pulling any beautiful young thing who might have been her husband's lover down to a watery grave. So you see, you really should come in before dark or you're gonna be having sushi for dinner. I was out of options. Until now, I'd played possum hoping he'd lose interest, but he just kept pushing and pushing. As the frustration welled up inside me, mixing with the fatigue, something snapped and I yelled, What the fuck's your problem? Why can't you piss off and leave me alone? Desi's eyes widened. Even still, he kept a lid on that temper. In a patronizing voice, he said, I wasn't trying to scare you. I just hate anything bad to happen is all. Another gust of wet air carried his foul breath toward me, overpowering the rich, leafy scent of pine. Gagging, I said, thanks, but I'd rather take my chances with Susie. What did you eat for lunch, dog shit? Beneath Desi's coat, there was a large hunting knife strapped to his waist. He grabbed it from the holster and picked at his long, yellow fingernails. Then he angled the edge of the blade so that the last slither of sunlight blinded me. You know, if you're gonna be a bitch maybe I should come over there and teach you some manners? Shielding my eyes from the light, I said, what are you gonna do? Breathe on me. That sure set him off. Desi wrestled off his boots, hopping from leg to leg, then shed his jacket. It was never my intention to rile him up. I just wasn't thinking clearly. As he stepped into the water, his jaw clenched because of the biting cold. Let's see how funny you were once I cut that fucking tongue out. I pushed as fast as I could, heart slamming against my chest. My attacker shuffled after me, submerged up to his waist until he was far out enough to start swimming. No matter how hard my arms worked, I didn't seem to move very fast at all. Within seconds, Desi's strokes were so close they made frothing waves which splashed across my back. Every few seconds he lunged or swiped at the board, rocking it from side to side. I gritted my jaw tight and put everything into paddling. I swear I paddled as hard as I could in my exhausted state. Soon he got a hand on the board and held it in place. Using the wide end of the paddle, I cracked him across the top of the head. Furious, he tilted the board's tail sideways, hurling me overboard. The water hit worse than an ice bath. I must have swallowed half the lake in three giant gulps. When I resurfaced, sputtering, Desi's hand clamped tight around my neck from behind and then he dragged me back in the direction of the embankment. What's the matter? He asked, his mouth pressed up against my left ear. You've lost your sense of humor. As ripples coursed through the water, cutting back and forth, an enormous sense of relief washed over me. Through chattering teeth, I said, you know Desi, you had the Susie story all wrong. Is that right now? He asked, still swimming. You were right about her husband cheating. But Susie didn't kill herself. Her husband did it. Why? Was she a stupid bitch who couldn't take a compliment? She found them. Her husband. Plus the girl. But her husband was furious he got caught. So he bashed her head in with a rock and dumped the body. Now there's an idea. But that's bad news for you, I gasped. Cause sinking Susie does haunt this place. I think it's about time you shut the food, Desi stopped swimming and looked down at his legs. I did too. 
Wrapped around his ankle, there was a hand, a withered hand bleached white except for where the flesh had rotted away, exposing a deep, hectic red. Attached to it was a mummified figure, barely visible in the gloom. I could make out a bundle of barnacles covering a skull with a dented left side. In place of a nose and eyes and lips there were sunken caverns, the features eaten away by fish and rot long ago. It was a living corpse. It was the spirit of the lake. It was sinking Susie. While Desi floated there, terrified, I bit into the soft flesh of his hand. The second he let go, I pushed my feet into his chest and kicked away. Desi got reeled away, arms flailing in every direction, desperate for something, anything to latch onto. Within seconds he'd zipped 50 meters, alternating between screaming and gurgling each time a fresh wave slapped him across the face. In the center of the lake, he spun round and round as if circling a drain before disappearing in a hissing column of foam. A steady stream of bubbles rose and I floated there watching until the final one went pop. It was over. Desi had become another of the figures trapped down there, arms floating above his head, fingers swaying against the current. The latest link in a long chain of Susie's victims. I swam back to the embankment. Alone at long last, I toweled myself off. By the time I'd pulled on my sweater, my board and paddle had drifted over by pure chance, as if guided by invisible hands. Then I set off home, already planning my next trip. I swear, I only go out there for the peace and quiet. I'm as shocked as anybody when the trips turn violent. Mom taught us one rule, always check for your shadow. Every few hours, the three of us, Mom, Cully, and me would do a shadow check. It was as second nature as taking a sip of water. Shadow check, my mom would call, and we'd both look down, checking that our shadow was still there. I thought everyone did this. We were homeschooled, so no one really told me otherwise. And my one friend down the block, Samantha, was a little strange herself, so she never seemed to notice. But then mom got a job and Cully and I went to school. And that's when everything collapsed. What are you doing? Paige asked me as we stood outside for recess one cool fall afternoon. Shadow check, I replied, shadow check, she asked, confused. What's that? I squinted at her. You don't know what a shadow check is? It was like she told me she didn't know how to brush her teeth. I explained slowly in simple terms like I was talking to a baby. You look at the ground. To check your shadow is still there. She obediently looked at the ground. There it is. Then she raised her arms out in front of her and linked them, making her shadow look like the letter P look. It's like P for Paige. In no time at all, half of the class was doing it. We bound out for recess and someone would shout, shadow check. The kids would contort their bodies into weird shapes to make their shadows look like elephants or cats or letters and we'd try to guess what they were. That went on nicely for about three days. Then horror struck. On Thursday afternoon, it was overcast. Shadow check. Thomas shouted. I diligently looked down and saw my shadow. But when I looked up, I realized nobody else had a shadow. For a second I wanted to panic, and scream, and run. But then I took a deep breath and did exactly what my mom taught me. I grabbed Paige first. Hey, she protested. But I didn't listen. I held on with a vice grip and started pulling her back towards the school. When the shadow goes away, hide in darkness for a day. The mantra echoed in my head. The school had a basement, I'd heard the teachers mention it. The basement would be safe. All we had to do was stay there until the morning. Let go of me. Paige screeched, finally yanking her wrist out of my grasp. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? I screamed back. We have to hide. The kids weren't smiling anymore. They were staring at me, backing away like I was a rabid animal. We have to hide. I screamed again. All the shadows are gone. I grabbed at Paige again, but she dodged this time. I lost my footing and fell onto the asphalt. Pain stung my knees. I looked up at my classmates. Why aren't they hiding? What are you doing? Run. I screamed. That's when a teacher helped me up and took me right to the principal's office. I should have explained more clearly, my mother told that night as she tucked me in. The shadow thing is only for us. It's okay if other people don't have shadows. Why? Sadness flashed across her face for a second. Then she shook her head. That's just the way it is. No one talked to me at recess anymore. 
not even Paige. I sat alone all the time. I noticed now that there were many days and some classrooms even when people didn't have shadows. I always did, but they didn't. Months passed and eventually kids forgot about the incident. That's what kids do forget. Sometimes I wish forgiving and forgetting came easier to adults. Paige would run up to me at recess and we'd play hopscotch. She never brought up the fact that even on an overcast day, my shadow still danced across the chalk lines, mirroring my own movements. Except sometimes, they were the slightest bit out of sync. Like my shadow was moving on a split-second delay. As I got older, however, things got more complicated. In 7th grade science, the teacher taught us about the sun and optics and light, prisms and rainbows and the cones and rods in our eyes. And she mentioned that our shadow was just the absence of light, that our bodies were blocking out the sun or the overhead fluorescent lights. It didn't make sense to me then that my shadow or anyone else's would be able to disappear. If the lighting didn't change and I didn't move, how could a shadow suddenly disappear? Coley was now old enough to insist we called her by her real name, but she was still too young to understand the argument I had with my mom that night. It's not possible. I shouted as she worked on her coloring book upstairs. You're lying to me. I'm not lying to you, my mother pleaded. Yes, you are. I ran across the living room to get in my mom's face. Walked right past the ornate glass lamp that stood on the end table. My mom's eyes widened. She looked at the ground. And that's when I realized my shadow was gone. The lamp was behind me. My shadow should have been on the floor in front of me. But it wasn't. Run, she whispered. When I didn't move, she began to shout. Go to Coley. Go. I hesitated for half a second. Then I sprinted for the stairs. Turn OFF the light, she shouted after me. I darted in and closed to the door. Then I bent down and yanked out the plug to the lamp. Hey, Coley said. I'm coloring. Shua, I whispered. What a... My shadow disappeared. Coley was too young to remember the day her shadow disappeared. She'd only been a year old. Mom had scooped her out of the playpen, grabbed me by the hand, and took the three of us into the basement. We spent the night down there in total darkness. Eating canned beans and sleeping on old comforters laid out on the cement floor. But she knew that it was bad. She scrambled over to her bed and pulled the covers over her head. I stood in the center of the room, listening for mom's footsteps. They never came. Is she staying down there? But we had so many lights on down there. It would be safer to just run to us. I crept towards the door, my heart pounding, slipping over the Barbies Coley had all over the floor. Mom, I called out through the door. Nothing. I opened the door just a crack and peered out. I could see the stairs, the light spilling out from the living room. But everything was silent. Maybe she went into the basement. Maybe a shadow appeared cast across the wall. No, she's still down there. But no, that couldn't be my mom's shadow. It was too short. And even though the edges were blurry, the shadow sort of looked like it had a ponytail. Not a short hair in a pixie cut like my mom. That's not mom. That's me. The blurry edges sharpened. And then the figure, the shadow, came into view. My ponytail, my upturned nose, my knock knees. The thing crouched down and pulled at something, yanking it, moving completely independent of me. A dragging sound, my mother's feet came into view, still and lifeless. I gasped. My hand clapped to my mouth, but it was too late. The shadow froze, turned to stare directly at me. And then with huge, loping strides, it started up the stairs, I slammed the door shut clicked the lock. Then I jumped under the covers with Cully, my entire body trembling. The police never found mom's body. She was eventually declared legally dead. Cully and I were sent away to live with our grandparents. They didn't seem to know anything about the shadow. They never asked us to do shadow checks. The only remark in 10 years was my grandma on a particularly cloudy day remarking how strange it was that I cast a perfect shadow on the sidewalk in front of us. I watched it as I walked and noticed its movements weren't perfectly in sync with my own. As the years went by and my shadow didn't disappear again, I started to get complacent. I checked for it less and less frequently. I started to lead a normal life, getting hired as a real estate agent. Coley, now going by her name Rebecca, is 19 and in college. I even started to persuade myself that my shadow didn't kill her. 
that my mom ran away after our fight and my memory of the shadow was my way of coping with it. Because it was harder to accept my mom had abandoned us than it was to accept an evil shadow had killed her. That's what I told myself until tonight. As I sat down on my computer to finish writing a house listing, I noticed there was no shadow of my fingers on the keyboard. No shadow on the linoleum under the desk. I ran to turn off all the lights. But I don't think I was fast enough. Because when I ran to close the blinds to block out the light from the street lamp below, I saw my shadow. Walking across the dark street. Disappearing into the night. So please, I beg you. If you see any strange shadows in your home or outside, something you don't think is cast by the lights, by the objects in your home, something that looks different, hide. Somewhere pitch dark where no shadows can be cast until morning. To start with, I just want to say I wasn't a bad kid. I did some pretty shitty stuff, but I wasn't intentionally bad. Guess in the end, intentions don't matter much though. The town I grew up in was small. We had a main street with shops like the post office, bakery, and butchers, and apart from a small block of concrete with a few pipes bolted down, the local skate park, and I used that term very loosely, that was about it. We were a mining town, so most of the men went to the quarry during the week, while the women stayed in town, teaching and nursing, running the bakery and stores alike. Our lives were set in stone, or at least they were meant to be. We would, like the generations before us, grow up and begin the same work our parents and grandparents did, having our own children and the cycle repeating. And maybe it would have had things been different. According to my parents, or my mother at least, I was a wild child. Ever since I was little, I seemed to want to explore more. I was more headstrong, more questioning, than the other little girls she taught at nursery. She said it jokingly, half-heartedly, but I saw something else in her expression, something that looked and felt like fear. My father never said much, just stared over his glasses, his bushy eyebrows perched between a frown and a grimace whenever I spoke. I learned to avoid him when he was home, only really seeing him at supper time, and while we ate there was little time for words. Every night mum would do something to help others, she would sew and mend clothing for the children at her school, the poor families having little chance of buying new and the second-hand clothing was always ripped and dirty. Dad smoked his pipe, sat on his recliner in the lounge, drowning out his family in the hum of the radio where a man's voice played out, telling stories and fables. I snuck out feeling the cool night air against my skin, the goosebumps of danger with doing the wrong thing. I tried to convince my friends to join me, but no one else would. I loved my friends, I did, but they were similar to my parents in the way they didn't want to do anything much, they stayed in reading novels or helping their mamas bake, sorting tools for their dads who did home improvement projects. Most families were the same in this town. I'd always had a suspicion, but once I began sneaking out of my house, I started sneaking into others. It was an accident the very first time, honest. I saw a house, the curtains still open, but there were no lights on inside. I stood outside and stared in, I could sort of make out the lounge suite and see there were framed photos on the walls. For some reason, I just walked towards it, intrigued to be looking in at someone else's life, I guess, I don't know. I tried the front door, which was unlocked. I wasn't surprised no one, including my family, bothered with locking the doors. We were a small and safe town. Our crime rate was basically non-existent. The door swung open and I closed it gently behind me, my heart pounding as I stood quietly at the threshold, just waiting to hear footsteps or voices at any moment. But nothing happened. I regained composure and stared to snoop around. I wasn't going to steal anything, I had no need. I just simply looked around, wondering about the family, about their lives. After a while of exploring the house, I left, making sure nothing was out of place. I closed the door softly behind me and walked home. They would never know anyone had been inside their house. I had found a new hobby. I was a weird kid, sure. But I never meant to harm anybody. I did it more and more, any empty place I could find. I had some close calls, with cars pulling into the driveway while I was still upstairs in a bedroom, the front door opening before I'd had time to close the back door I'd escaped through. I was never caught, though. I wish I had been. I wish to God someone had caught me. 
It's been a reoccurring fantasy for years, the dream I dream over and over, the one I wake up in a cold sweat from, tears burning my eyes, while burning my stomach. But no one caught me in their house, no one stopped me. So I went to the house on Lafroy Street and what happened there changed my life forever. That night, it was cold. I was about to give up. I'd been out for an hour at least and not come across one empty house. I felt tired, anxious. There was no reason for it, not when I could pinpoint. I made the choice to head home, get out of the damp, and so I began walking. I was near my street when I saw a familiar car speed off down the road. Mr. Chester Moore. He was a teacher at my school and apparently, so the gossiping girls at school claimed, he had some terrible accident years before which meant he wasn't fit for work in the mines, so that's why he was one of the rare males who held a job in the city. He taught science and he was pretty nice, always taking the time to listen to us and explain things in a kind way. He walked with a hobble and a special cane which made the gossip's rumors seem to be more than maybe just Chinese whispers but no one really knew for sure. The rumors ranged from the accident being shooting himself in the leg while hunting to being stabbed by a group of ninjas. I know, I know. Looking back that just sounds ridiculous but you gotta remember, we were just kids back then. I had the idea then to go to his house to see what he lived like, to see if I could find any information about the accident maybe, find the truth about what happened and I'd been so popular, everyone would want to be my friend. My 14-year-old brain thought it would be cool to be the one to break the mystery of our teacher, but looking back as an adult I can't help but feel such sadness at the invasion of privacy I had bestowed on a kind, gentle teacher. His door was unlocked, of course it was. I slid inside, silent and smooth, carefully closing the door behind me and set to work straight away. The house was nondescript, the same style furniture I'd seen in all the other homes, including my own. A cat litter tray sat in the corner of the lounge, but there was no sign of the cat. I wondered if it may be hiding from me, perhaps curled up under the couch, and the more I thought it, the more I felt the sense as though I was really being watched. I'd never felt uneasy in a house before, not even when I was close to getting caught. It was, in a strange way, an excitement, a thrill, at nearly getting caught and the feeling I felt that night it was different. It was my senses urging me to get the hell out of there. But my 14-year-old self didn't listen and instead I forged on, finding myself in a cupboard under the staircase when I heard a voice above me. I held in a shocked gasp, racking my brain thinking if I had been quiet enough, waiting for the partially closed door behind me to be pulled open and me exposed. But it didn't happen. The voice was muffled at first. And bizarrely it sounded as if whoever it was was humming show tunes. The voice rose, getting louder, and I tried hard to make out what they were saying. I wish I hadn't. The man was talking to a softly sobbing child, telling them they must stop crying at once, everything was okay. He began to hum the show tunes again, this time louder and more aggressively. It didn't seem to help as the child began to wail louder, sobs turning into terrified screams that, after a loud bang, suddenly ceased. It sounded as if something someone had been thrown against the wall. I heard a soft thud a few moments after the bang, as if whatever it was had slid down the wall and onto the hardwood floor below. The silence didn't stay for long. The man began muttering something to himself that I couldn't quite make out, something that sounded like made me and shush. He repeated it over and over until his shotun's humming began again and until the two was drowned out by the sound of water running. It seemed to run for a long time, the pipes in the walls next to me groaning, sounding like ghosts moaning. I felt scared. More than scared. I thought about making my escape but I couldn't hear where the man was. And that didn't feel safe to try and leave when he could literally be waiting outside the door. The door was open a crack and with a racing heart I leant down to try and take a peek and that's when I saw the flash of pink fabric, the pink princess dressing gown of someone small and who should have been safe in bed. I wanted to reach out to grab her, stop her from investigating the strange noises that must have woken her up from a peaceful slumber. But I stood fearful and motionless. I didn't try and grab her. I didn't stop her. When I heard her blood-curdling scream just seconds later, I tasted salt on my lips and realized I was crying. Janny? Why are you on the floor? Why is your head red? Wake up, Janny. Are you just tricking me like on Halloween? I'm going to get mom if you don't get up. 
The footsteps above me were slow, deliberate, and soon I heard the girl in the pink princess dressing gown choking and spluttering and saying no, no. Again, it was silent. Again, I heard the thump of something, someone, being dropped or falling on the hardwood floor above me. The man began muttering again, and then I heard the footsteps taper off, the sound of my own thumping heart, the only thing I could hear. I took my chance. I didn't try to peek out of the door, I just pushed it open. It didn't squeak, but the anticipation of it doing so did as much damage to my stress levels as if it had of. Silence. The hallway was empty. The front door was in view. A few steps. A few big steps and I was out the front door, I was gone. But then I heard the groan. It wasn't coming from upstairs, but next to me. I stifled a scream, my body screaming not to look down, do not look down, but I did, I looked. A woman lay just ahead, blood pooling around her, streaks of blood on the floor in thick lines where she had dragged herself toward the front door from wherever she had been hurt. Her face was half gone, the bone and teeth exposed on her lower jaw. When I was swollen closed, her nose dried with black blood. Her legs were missing from below the knees. I opened my mouth to speak, to ask if she was okay or to scream, I have no fucking idea, I think I was in shock. For a kid who wasn't even allowed to play video games, I hadn't been exposed to a lot. That's what I've told myself all these years anyway. Tried to justify it to myself, for not helping, for being scared. Anyway, when I opened my mouth, nothing came out. I shook my head at her, my mouth wide open yet wordless. I wanted to tell her I was going to get help, but I couldn't form the words. She blinked at me for a moment, the realization sinking in. She was as good as dead, and that's literally what happened. I saw the light go out of her eyes before it really went out. She lay and stared, not seeing. I haven't told people this full story only bits and pieces. But everyone says the same it wasn't my fault. I was just a kid. But they don't know the truth I can't bring myself to tell anyone. The words get caught in my throat. So I have to write it down, get it out. I had just about reached the front door when I heard the sound that sent shivers down my spine, a cold rock to the bottom of my stomach. I heard a baby wail, but I pretended I didn't. I pretended that it was just in my head, lying to myself to save myself. What a joke. I should have done something. I was at the end of the street when I saw the car of my science teacher drive back down the road toward the house I had just escaped. I wanted to warn him. But of course I didn't. I ran home and didn't look back. It was all over the paper in the days and weeks after. The first murder-suicide in our town. I heard my parents talking about it when they thought I was in bed, how Mr. Chester Moore went crazy and killed his entire family before barbarically killing himself. But it wasn't a murder-suicide. There was a lunatic on the loose who had killed a whole family and framed an innocent man. I tried my best to forget about it, to move on, not blame myself. I became a good kid and I didn't go into anyone's empty homes anymore. I tried my best to make amends for what I hadn't done. That's why I'm a social worker these days. I moved on from that night when I was 14, or so I thought, until recently when I had a new client. James? He was 12. His parents had been going through a messy divorce and James had taken it upon himself to find a new hobby. He had started breaking into homes and stealing. Recently, he had broken into a home and killed the couple who lived there. It wasn't my first sort of case like this. But it was the first time that one of the kids said something that trially terrified me. James told me it wasn't him, there was another man there, one who muttered to himself and hummed along to show tunes. I haven't slept right since talking with James. I swear if I listen hard enough as I lay awake in bed at night, I can make out that hum of shotuns coming from somewhere in my house. I've checked a dozen times. No one is ever there. But the sound remains, I don't know if I'm going crazy or not. Maybe getting my truths out about what happened that night might help me. I've tried to contact the police, but they tell me the case is closed, long closed. That I need to let things go. I wish it was as simple as that. If there's any updates, I'll be sure to let you know.